Hi, this is Royce Freeman, and who am I with this evening, sir? You're with Adam Marcus, my brother. All right. To the uninitiated, who are you? And uh, tell us a little about yourself. Um, what is your uh, oeuvre? <laughs> uh, well, I am a filmmaker, um, writer, director, producer. I'm an acting coach and teacher. Um, I have been a theater impresario of sorts. Uh, I <clears throat> started very early, uh, graduate of NYU, uh, to school of the arts with, uh, uh, best picture a movie called, so you like this girl that starred Tom Lennon and Joe Latruglio, a couple of huge names in comedy. Um, I was running two theaters back East at that time from the time I was 15, when I started my first theater company called Westport theater works, that company made so much money that I was actually able to go to NYU and pay, pay for the school and to pay to make my, um, my films there. And uh, I also had grown up around uh, Sean S. Cunningham, who was the father of my best friend, Noel Cunningham. And uh, I got to work on things like Spring Break with his incredible wife, uh, Susan Cunningham, uh, God rest her soul, who edited that film. And uh, I was 13 when I was an apprentice editor under her. And uh, after winning Best Picture at NYU, I was offered two jobs, one from David Lynch and Mark Frost's company, to work on season two of Twin Peaks as a writer. And the, other, the other offer I got was from Sean Cunningham to come out to Los Angeles and quote unquote, be his bitch for a year. And he would give me my shot. And uh, only several months after moving to LA with $300 in my pocket, no debt over my head and no driver's license, uh, I bought a VW Bug, 63 VW Bug that I lived in um, I could pay for the car, but I wasn't allowed to drive the car. And uh, so I lived in that car, worked for Sean Cunningham, and I set up my first studio picture, uh, a movie called Johnny Zombie, that ended up becoming my boyfriend's back at Disney with Sean Cunningham. And uh, in return, Sean gave me uh, the chance to write and direct Jason Goes to Hell, the ninth entry in the Friday the 13th saga, once New Line had picked up the rights to Jason Voorhees. And so, uh, so I did that, <clears throat> and uh, that was an amazing experience. And being a lifelong, ridiculous horror fan, and most specifically a Friday 13th fan, uh, it was kind of a dream come true. Uh, I'm in the movie as well as Officer Bish. Yeah, Bish. Yeah, Bish. And uh, from and Jay there... And Jason's, and Jason's breathing. And I am Jason's breathing. That's true. I'm Jason's grunting. I am, uh, I'm actually most of the foley for most of the men in the movie. Um, and, uh, and after that I was offered sort of every horror sequel you could find, um, you know, <laughs> Amityville 97, uh, Pumpkinhead 2, Leprechaun Back to the Hood. Um, I turned all those down because I didn't want all of the films that I made to have numbers at the end of them. So I wanted to do original material and uh, cut to my brother Kip had written a wonderful play, actually pretty pretentious play, but a wonderful play uh, called Deep Trees that he and I worked on for months together. He, he wrote uh, many, many drafts, and I beat him up all along the way for a movie that we ended up calling Snow Days, which became sort of a little indie darling for a couple of years there. It was really kind of amazing. We won a ton of awards, went to amazing festivals, and landed at Sundance, where the movie was um, kind, of a, kind of a big deal. Uh, and you can see the poster up right there. That's the poster for Snow Days, which eventually lost its title and got a new title called Let It Snow, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point. Uh, that movie propelled me into a career in television for several years, where I sold five TV series in a year and a half, to five different networks. And uh, right after that, my writing partner, Deborah Sullivan, who was my wife of the last uh, couple decades, that's for sure. Um, Deborah and I, <laughs> we, um, we sold a bunch of scripts. We, we actually sold scripts to pretty much every studio in town. And uh, I ended up writing and directing a movie called Conspiracy, starring Val Kilmer, and Gary Cole, and Jennifer Esposito. I then went off to, uh, after that experience, which was horrifying, Deborah and I wrote sequels to Cabin Fever. We wrote uh, Texas Chainsaw, the 2013 version, and um, a wonderful little movie called, uh, called Momentum 
that was originally called Gravity. That was a blacklist script that Deborah and I, it was our third script we had written together back in the 90s. And that movie took 20 years. We wrote it in 1995. It got released in 2015. And uh, that one stars Morgan Freeman and James Purefoy and the amazing Olga Kirilenko. And um, and then I decided that I had had enough of people taking our scripts and making movies that I didn't quite believe in the end product. And so I said, we're going to have to go it alone and and kind of not be beholden to studios. Um, and that includes studio paychecks. And uh, you take a hit, but you, if, you, if you're going to believe in what you're going to do and you're going to love the work that you make, you have to kind of do it on your own. So Deborah and I joined forces with my best friend and partner, Brian Sexton, who is a remarkable filmmaker. And we created Skeleton Crew. And um, for the last... Six years, we have been doing our own thing, and I've never been happier in my life. Um, the first movie we produced out of Skeleton Crew was a movie called Secret Santa, which is a Christmas haramity. Uh, it is my favorite film of everything that I've done, and it is also the movie that somehow has become my, my best-reviewed and my most awarded movie of all the work that I've done. And now I am doing... Uh, I am doing six films right now. Um, Skeleton Crew is involved in six different projects. Uh, everything from a beautiful documentary series about the remarkable magician Doug Henning, all the way through to a documentary about my first film, Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, called Hearts of Darkness, The Making of the Final Friday. And we are also doing four uh, feature films, two much bigger budgeted and two micro budget films. So, um, and we are pushing uh, a new television series that uh, I can't really talk about just yet. Um, no spoilers on that, but it's it's been um, it's been kind of a remarkable um, second chapter to my career. Uh, is this forming this uh, contingency of brilliant actors and wonderful filmmakers and starting to create a groundswell about something that I truly believe in in telling stories that matter. So that was that's a mouthful. Uh, that's definitely. Um, <clears throat> you asked for the CV, you got it, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so going in the way back machine. Um, yeah. Talk talk about. You mentioned that uh, you were friends with Noel Cunningham, and then you kind of uh, grew up in that house. And yeah. I famously famously I've heard you refer to Harry Manfredini as Uncle Harry. You yep. know, Uncle Heshi is what everybody called him. So that was. <laughs> so but, so talk about yeah being around that that uh, that troop of filmmakers like Sean and Wes and Steve Miner and Harry mm -hmm. and talk mm -hmm. about the 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 Westport days. Uh oh, the salad days. Um my time in Westport, Connecticut. Look, here's the thing. I, I was I was born in Manhattan and raised in Connecticut. I was raised in in, in Westport, Connecticut. Um my my dad lived in Manhattan, my mom lived in, in Westport. So I bounced back and forth. So I had the best of both worlds. I had this incredible uh you know time in, in New York City that uh that in many ways made me who I am. Um, and it was the rough from, and tumble. I'm from, I'm from New York too. I'm from New York Love too. Love it. Where, where, whereabouts, brother? Um, I was born in Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, sure. And I, mm -hmm. so, and I, li I lived in, in, when I was a young, young lad, uh, we, mm -hmm. my parents, my parents lived in a uh, apartment in Manhattan. We had a bay window. And eventually sure. Ooh, when I got to be nice. a cer certain age, when I got to be a certain age, they moved to Queens, New York, which is where I lived until I moved to Florida uh, in the early uh, 90s. And That's I got to awesome. tell you, brother, um, I we left when I was too young to experience really anything that wasn't outside of my parents' uh, view. So I, I never got to experience teenage years and stuff in New York mm -hmm. and, and stuff. I, ha I had to go back to New York when my grandfather later in life uh, grew ill and then passed on but we went to new york as teenagers my brother and i got to go to the east village and roam around and just be free and untethered untethered youths and i actually saw the star wars special edition of a new hope um i saw it in a, a movie theater in new york um and it was amazing to see that for the first time uh, my first memory seeing any movie at all is the shot of darth vader coming down the sh the Imperial shuttle on the Death Star at the beginning of Return of the Jedi. My parents mm -hmm. took me to the movies. My parents took me to the movies age three. I guess they couldn't find a babysitter. 
but they took me age three, but I have this image burned into my brain of this guy deep breathing in that James Earl Jones voice in that suit coming up with smoke around him. And it just, ever since I saw that image, I knew I wanted to be involved in movies. And that's, and I never, I never looked back. I love it. I love it, dude. Well, I can tell you, um, it was, uh, it was the star cruiser <clears throat> in the beginning of, uh, of new hope when I was nine years old flying over my head that made me go, that's what I want to do. And my father, of course, thought I wanted to be an astronaut. I was like, no, 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 no. I want to make that. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the, there's no turning back. Star Wars, Star Wars is, um, for so many of us, the thing that lit the inspiration in us. And it, it's funny. I think in some ways it's why there's so, why Star Wars fans tend to not be very happy people. Um, because it started so many dreams and then we became super critical of anything that was Star Wars. Like there was this anger and this kind of surliness where the funny thing is you meet Star Trek fans and they are the sweetest, most gentle, happy people. Um, Star Wars fans <laughs> seem to be cut from a different cloth. <laughs> but uh, it is it is the thing that launched a thousand filmmakers. It just is. It, 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 let, us, it let us believe that anything was true. You know, we can make anything possible. There's there's dreamers that were bought uh, that were uh, sorry that were that were brought to life during those movies and um, I feel blessed I feel blessed to have been born at a time when Star Wars happened it's uh, you believed in magic we all did what was um I left New York when I was so young so I didn't mm -hmm. get to really experience the um, the teenage years and the sure. whatever sure. whatever mischief I could have got into as a, a sure. as a youth. Well, but by the way, you were a teenager in the nineties, right? So you were you were a teenager yeah. in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, I was a teenager in the eighties. Uh, the difference between New York in the eighties and New York in the nineties is so stark. It's such a completely different city um, because it got Disneyfied in the in the nineties. It got cleaned up. It got gentrified, and they moved all the homeless out, and they. They did a lot, you know, Rudy Giuliani did a lot of shenanigans to, to, to clean up that city. Um, and the truth is, is that, you know, the, the, the New York of my youth is the New York of taxi driver. Um, it was rough, man. I mean, it was, it was rough. By the way, you could also afford to live in that city. Um, anyone could live in New York. Like it was, it was a cheap city to live in. It was hard. Um, my father was, you know, had always done well business-wise. So we we lived in, you know, in, in reasonable places. They were never the Taj Mahal, but they were they were lovely. And then as a as I got into my twenties, my father had made a tremendous amount of money, and we 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 lived better in New York, which was which was terrific. But no, in the in the seventies and eighties, man, it was uh, it was dark. When I consider <clears throat> the amount of time I was allowed at a, as eleven year old kid to walk around New York on my own. Um, you know, I grew up in, in New York when Times Square was, you know, porn theaters, like nothing but hardcore porn. And it was kind of spilling out into the streets and the drug problem was insane. I, I worked um, even in college and this is in the late 80s, almost the beginning of the 90s. Um, I worked for our Greenberg and Associates. On. My dad worked. My, my dad worked for that company um, in the early 80s and 70s. That's awesome. Well, Bob Greenberg was my father's best friend. They had houses next door to each other in Fire Island. And so we were, I was very close with their, with, with all of them. Uh, Bob was a tough boss, even though I came in through, you know, through, through my father. Um, you know, and I, I worked on, you know, things like Silence of the Lambs and Goodfellas and Bonfire of the Vanities. I mean, I got to work with remarkable filmmakers. It was really a giant leap for me. But I have to tell you, we were on 39th Street <clears throat> between 9th and 10th. It was Crack Street. That's literally what they called it. It was called Crack Street. And you would come out of this, you know, remarkable Bauhaus-style building that was inset into tenements, like this gorgeous California building in the middle of the worst area of New York City, um, close to Hell's Kitchen. And you'd walk out, there would be knife fights in the street. I'm not kidding. Like actual guys stabbing each other in the street midday. Um, I remember this is again, this is the late eighties. This is during the time when AIDS had really hit, hit a, a huge, uh, Zenith in Manhattan. I had a lot of friends who, who passed away from AIDS. Um, and you, you saw guys, I, I literally watched a guy get knived in the cheek. He actually got a knife in his cheek and he started grabbing the blood off his face and throwing it at the other guy. 
You have never seen a street of people disperse faster. Like people ran. The minute this guy was throwing his own blood, it was like, oh, get out of here now. Um, but dude, that's that's the New York I grew up in. Like that is not New York anymore. That hasn't been New York since the 90s. Like that that New York is gone. Um, and is that look, the new is that the, is that is that the New York of John Jonathan Larson's rent? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that uh, Jonathan Larson's rent is just really when I when I was going to school. It's the mid 80s um, is what he's talking about, because, again, the AIDS crisis started. And by the way, um, you know, my, my <laughs> the first feature I set up when I got to L.A., uh, uh, Johnny Zombie was in response to the AIDS epidemic. Um, that's that's what that movie was really about um, in its initial form. Um, so. It, that whole thing really hit all of us because we all lost a lot of friends. There were there were just people who, you know, one day you just didn't see them for a while. And if you caught a glimpse or got a call or went to see someone, they were a different human being. They, they were a skeleton and, and covered in sores. And I, it, it was like a different human being. But the same person was inside pleading for people to love them and to, to understand. Um so yeah, that's what Johnny Zombie was originally about. Uh, slightly darker than the Disney picture they 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 made. Um, what ins- what inspired you to make Johnny Zombie in that original form, much like Rent is a, a musical? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What inspired um, that? Well, Dean Dean is brilliant. Dean Dean had this incredible idea about um, a, a zombie movie a zombie comedy no less but an r-rated comedy which by the way originally was a musical we had musical numbers in johnny zombie um and uh dean we always said was you know george romero meets walt disney um he he was equal parts of those two things when i came into the project in college when we started workshopping it together um the project started to evolve And we came up with this concept of um, the cemetery that Johnny comes out of, where he's resurrected to go to, so that he can get to the prom, um, which is such a ridiculous, silly conceit, but kind of wonderful. Well, that that whole cemetery is full of other zombies, and the rule was: as long as you don't leave the confines of the cemetery, you can be there forever. These these zombies get up every night, and they play pinochle in the mausoleum. So there was this community, right? And they're all these gentle people who are the same people they were before death, except they're rotting slightly and they they don't smell so good. And as long as they don't leave the graveyard, they're safe. Well, Johnny has a real reason, a compulsion to leave the graveyard, which is to go to the prom with Missy McLeod, his, his high school sweetheart. And he leaves, he leaves the, the confines. The problem is, is that if you leave the cemetery, you will decay in three days unless you eat the flesh of the living, which Johnny finds repulsive and doesn't want to do it. The problem is the prom is in five days. Then he leaves and he's going to only have three days unless he eats the flesh of the living. Well, Johnny's brave act makes all the people in the cemetery, all the other zombies decide that they want to leave the cemetery, that they want to be part of the real world. And they want to go back to their families and be in love and raise their children and all this well, suddenly all of these zombies start showing up back home. They don't want to eat anybody. They don't want to terrorize anybody. They just want to be loved and treated the way they were in life. The problem is, is that all people see is the outside cover. And they scream and they run. And suddenly they have torches and they're chasing the zombies back to the to the graveyard to destroy them. But these are their neighbors and their friends and their loved ones. And it's because they look different that suddenly they're outcast, but they're the same people. And so we were trying to tell an allegory about what had happened during the AIDS crisis where these were the same people and they weren't contagious to anyone. Um, They weren't gonna give you AIDS. It just wasn't gonna happen. Um, And yet they were treated like lepers and treated as though they were less than human. And so Johnny Zombie took the zombie genre and equated it to the evil of people not being compassionate and not being understanding. Um, You know, the Guillermo del Toro, you know, the monsters are not the monsters. We are the monsters. 
So that's what Johnny Zombie originally was. There's a beautiful movie called Nightbreed, and uh-huh. uh, and Clive yeah, Barker made it. I and love it deals, that. deals with uh, the cabal of these people, and um, uh, I, I guess they use as a metaphor, but this place Midian, which is where yeah. uh, you know some Valhalla from biblical times, but the monsters are actually the heroes. Yes. And it's the humans, it's the mortals that are the evil ones because they just won't accept these people. Yep. And it's very interesting. It's very interesting when when storytellers do that, where they flip it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it and mm-hmm. it comes at something from a different angle, and it's it's refreshing when they do. I agree. I I, I agree. I, I I I can vividly picture your version of Johnny Zombie as you're telling me the story and. Maybe one day that version will come to life because in the in the age of remakes and reboots and mm-hmm. requels and all those things, uh, I bought the Kino Lorber version of uh, My Boyfriend's Back, and I had never seen it back in the day, but I bought it because of knowing years ago that there was that connection. I haven't brought sure. myself to watch it. Is it something worth seeing their version of it? Yeah, absolutely. Look, it, it, by the way, it's a, it, it's a sweet movie. Um it is flawed, but it's sweet. I will say, look, to see a very young uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman in one of his first performances as the bully is kind of amazing. The cast is incredible. I mean, the cast is really, like, it is a remarkable group of brilliant comic actors. And Bob Balaban ended up directing the movie, and he's a terrific director. Parents is a great film. Um, so, you know, th- there's, there's that. it definitely has its charms. Um, it's just not the movie we were creating and uh, Sean went for the big money. That's always what Sean does. So Disney had deep pockets and they were going to spend real money on this movie. New line wanted to make the movie as well, but they were going to make it for a lot less money. And that's where I wanted to make the film and they would have made the movie we wrote. So uh, that's a little heartbreaking, but uh, please, you know, the number of times Sean Cunningham has broken my heart. Eh. Did he at least buy you dinner before that he did before he screwed you? Yeah, Sean, Sean, Sean always kisses you before he fucks you. That's that's definitely true. So um, talk about growing up around the making of the um, the first Friday and um, that that factory of Cunningham Films churning out. Here come the Tigers, Bad News Bear yeah. ripoff, and, and and Manny's Orphans and all those. Yep. Yep. Um, look, here's the thing. I wanted so desperately to be a filmmaker from, from, from such an early age that the fact that my friend's dad made movies, I didn't care what the hell the movies were. I I was just excited to be around. Um, so I was always underfoot. I made myself useful, which meant I got to do things and work in the office and work in the editing room and, and sometimes be on set and, and just do cool stuff. Um, I think it was funny when I first, when, when everybody was kind of whispering about Noel and his dad, uh, Sean famously directed a movie called Together, which was an educational medical film. Uh, it was a porn movie. And uh, it starred Mar- Marilyn, Mar- Cham- Mar- Marilyn Chambers. Yeah. Marilyn Chambers, who went to the same high school as I did. Um, and so... I, I had a I had a kind of a schizophrenic um, childhood in, in in sort of the mentoring that went on because on one hand I had Sean who was this pornographer who also made Last House and Left which was you know at the time considered like the nastiest movie ever made um, and then he was making you know kids movies which is so nuts um, you know pornographer to children's movies it's it's very strange um, but here's the thing. On the other side of it, I was doing play readings with, uh, you know, Keir DeLay and Sandy Dennis because Westport, Connecticut was this bastion of artistry. So Paul Newman lived down the street. Martha Stewart, I would sing it at holiday parties uh, for her. Um, Neil Simon lived down the road. Uh, I mean, it, it is, it's a remarkable <laughs> It's a remarkable place. So, and 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 to give people context, uh, when Lucy and Desi move to Connecticut, they move to Westport. Uh, Bewitched happens in Westport. Ira Levin wrote The Stepford Wives about Westport. So Westport is this w- tiny little town that is this um, 
there's something sort of legendary about it. And the artists that lived just around the corner were brilliant. Like, and it was the people that, you know, because I was doing theater in that town and I was really, <coughs> excuse me, I was really involved in theater. Um, I worked with a ton of these artists. So I would be with Sean Cunningham and Susan Cunningham, by the way, Susan, who is God rest her soul. Uh, one of the most lovely kind women I've ever known in my life. She was really like another mother to me. Um, and there she was with Steve Miner. They were both editors. Um, in fact, they gave me all of the editing equipment, all these 16 millimeter ed editing equipment I went to NYU with was all from Susan and Steve. Um, so I'd be able to cut my films at NYU. Um, I, I was really blessed to be around these folks. And look, Sean was always a prickly pear, but Sean gave me money when I started my first theater company when I was 15. So he was this kind of weird patron who was generous to a fault in certain ways, but also just kind of a massive prick, like just not very nice. So it was such a weird experience with him. And look, I think he liked that I hung out with Noel because I was Noel's one friend that didn't do drugs or drink or get into all kinds of terrible situations. And Westport was a place where Noel went to the private school in Westport, right, which is a very expensive, beautiful private school. The private school is where the bad kids went. The public school is one of the best schools in the country every year. So it was, it was it, a lot of things turned on its head, man. It was, it was a strange, it was a strange upbringing. Um, I, uh, I had this, you know, this filmmaker who was, uh, you know, a weird abusive second father. And then I had, uh, this remarkable theater guy named Albert Pia, Al Pia, who, um, who really was my mentor, who really was the man who, who taught me the art in the arts. Sean was more the commerce of the arts and God bless him. Like he, I, I will say this, Sean Cunningham minus my partner, Brian Sexton, who is the single best producer I've ever worked with. Sean Cunningham was the best line producer I've ever experienced. Um, the guy could pull a dollar out of a dime. Easy. He's that guy. Uh, so that is his genius. It really is. The problem is everything is about money for Sean. Everything. Um, everything I experienced and, um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a weird, it was a weird situation, man, because you're, you're working with somebody that you look up to like a father figure. And then you're like, wow, this guy is definitely not a father figure. Like that's not, that's not who he is. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, it was, it was, it was wild. And by the way, look, <laughs> Wes Craven could not have been a bigger doll, could not have been a nicer, kinder man. Um, Tom Savini was freaking awesome when I was hanging out with him as a kid. Um, I will tell you this about Wes. He did, the, he, did, he did something so beautiful that he didn't think of as anything but just being Wes. So I was in my first year at NYU, and he was showing the movie Shocker at NYU, and then he came to talk to all of us, right? So the entire class is there, my, the whole freshman class, to see Shocker and to hear Wes talk. And as Wes walked in the room, as the film ended, Wes walks in the room. I'm in like the third or fifth row of the, of the theater. And Wes looks at it and goes, oh my God, Adam. And he walks out into the theater and gives me a hug. Um, there, there was never a bigger target placed on the back of a film student ever than that moment. Um, for some people, I was a hero. For others, I was public enemy number one. It was hilarious. Uh, but I got to tell you, I don't know if I've ever been so proud in my life as when Wes just like, why don't you give me a hug? Because I was little Adam, who he'd known since I was a little boy. Um, so, yeah, th this was this was a complicated, interesting group of people <laughs> to grow up around. Uh, <laughs> and, and all of that has sort of followed me into my career. And, you know, in many ways made me the person I am and in many ways showed me what not to do. I, when I produce, I don't do anything Sean did. I hope that I can be as good a line producer as him. I hope I can always support my director and get them what they need. But 
uh, I am very transparent in the way that I work. And, um, and I am, I love the artists I work with. I'm not in competition with them. I love them. Um, and so, you know, so I got taught a lot, man, in that situation. Absolutely. I remember you telling a beautiful story about, um, you were shooting the scene in, uh, Jace Goes to Hell and, um, the stunt court, the stunt lady who played Agent Marcus was running and there's shots in the movie because the letterboxing, you know, uh, supposed to cover her feet. There's shots where she's wearing shoes and you can see it in some shots she's not. But you st- tell that story about what you noticed and what you did. So Julie Michaels, Julie Michaels, the absolutely beautiful actress slash stunt woman, who, by the way, has now won several Emmys as being a stunt coordinator. She is she is badass. Um, and uh, funny enough, I'm actually speaking at a conference for Julie uh, early next month. I, I adore her. To this day, we're very close. Um, Julie was uh, she, <laughs> the first time we met. She came to my office at the stages uh, with uh, with Kane Hodder. She was in a robe, in a beautiful white little robe, uh, which she proceeded to drop. Uh, so that I could do a body check with her to make sure that she was what I wanted on camera for the opening of the film. Um, so literally the first day I met Julie, I saw Julie um, and uh, kind of fell in love with her to some degree because <laughs> she's gorgeous. Uh, but I got to tell you, I saw a young woman who was brave and extraordinary in every way, even in that first meeting. Um, she just was like, this is the job. Check me out. Let's do this. Um, and I just, I just, I just love her. So we're on set and she's, you know, kind of, uh, she's one of those people who's just up for anything and ready to go and was doing all her own stunts and was just a kick-ass, kick-ass chick. And she, um, <laughs> she was doing this running shot. Now here's a, a filmmaking trick for everybody out there who is a filmmaker and it's a, it's a great trick. So if you have somebody running through the woods, right, you can get a gimbal or a steady cam, and you can chase them. Um, if you want to go sideways running with them, you have to dig two complete trenches, one for the actor, one for the camera. And if you want a 30-foot run, which is not a lot of time on screen, uh, you have to dig that full 30 feet. Or, or you can dig a circular trench one circular trench through the woods. Then you plant the camera in the middle and you turn the camera as they run in a circle. And you kind of Hanna-Barbera the woods, which no one will ever notice that they're running past the same group of trees. No one ever has noticed. So Julie was in her circular trench. We're standing in the middle, all rotating with the camera. And uh, she does she does one two shots right. We do two different different uh, uh, close ups. And I come over to her. I say, "You okay?" She's oh doing great, boss. I said, "I need one more. I want to go wide and you know do some other things." She goes, "No problem, ready to go." And she starts to walk away from me. And as she's walking, I see there's something dark on the ground. And it's night, so I walk over. I look at it, and I say, "Julie, stop." She stops. She turns around. I say. Honey, you okay? Yeah, boss. Ready to go. Let's do it. I said, no, 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 no. Show me your feet. No, I'm good. I'm good, boss. I got it. I got it. I said, Julie, show me your feet. She picked up her feet one at a time, and both of them were bleeding. I walked over to Julie. I said, don't move. I walked over to Julie. She's in her towel, in her her Velcroed towel from the movie. I lift her up off of her feet. I'm 20, uh, 24, no, I'm 23, 23 when we shot this. I lift her up and I walk her to medical. They clean her up. She wasn't too bad. She was pretty good. She's pretty good. They, they, they bandage up her feet and then we put the booties on her. And I said, you don't take those off. She's like, but it's not going to look as good in the shot. I said, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not Alfred Hitchcock. I care about my actors. You will not get hurt on my set. You've already hurt yourself. You weren't going to tell me. From now on, always be straight with me. I will not allow my actors to get hurt. Um, that moment 
Julie has recounted that over and over again. And she recounts it, by the way, in the documentary we're making about the film right now. Um, when she recounts her story, I'm telling you, man, I wept. The whole crew started crying because this moment meant even more to her than I knew. There was an importance to this that I never imagined. And by the way, it's so funny because people are like, oh, you were so kind. I'm like, well, yeah, great. No, I was being who I am. I don't understand artists that don't respect and love fellow artists. I, you're a director. You've got, you, you have the trust of this cast and crew. And if you've earned that, you need to come through on that at all times. Those people, everyone on my set is my responsibility. Um, Julie is a remarkable woman and a remarkable performer and a great artist but she is a human being first and foremost, and she's somebody I care about. And so, no, she was not going to do one more step um, and hurt herself any further. Uh, the minute I knew anything was going on, I carried her off my set. And uh, by the way, we recreated the carry um, on set. I, as she jumped up into my arms. She was so cute too. She's like, Oh my God, I'm big now. I can't, you can't carry me. I'm, I'm like, you're big now. You're like a reed. Get over here. And I lifted her up and it was literally as though I was lifting, uh, you know, a small child. She is just amazing. And she's remarkable. There's an expression, I guess it's on the poster of American graffiti and it says, where were you in 62? Mm -hmm. And so where, where were you in 78 uh, or 79? Like talk about the first time you saw the first Friday 13th and then compare it to your experience being on set. The first time I saw Friday 13th, by the way, was in Sean's house. It was uh, from a Betamax copy of the movie. Um, we actually, Noel and I watched it a bunch of times. His dad let us watch it. We were 11 and uh and then we watched <laughs> this is an awesome this is awesome okay noel cunningham his birthday is friday the 13th wow mm -hmm. yep i wonder where his dad came up with the title um so noel's birthday is friday the 13th and on 19 in friday the 13th 1980 which is the day the movie takes place on Noel had a slumber party at his house with all of our friends and we showed Friday the 13th while it was in the theater. And um, it was amazing because Noel and I knew when, you know, that Jason was going to jump out of the water. Nobody there knew. We were all 11 years old, 12 years old tops. And Noel and I hid behind the couch where all of our friends were sitting. And at the end, the two of us jumped up and grabbed our friends. And they, dude, there was not a dry pair of pants in the house. <laughs> it was amazing. It was the greatest prank ever. So um, the first time I saw, the first time, very first time I saw Friday the 13th, it scared the crap out of me, um, especially Kevin Bacon's death. Um, I slept with extra pillows under my head for years because of that. Scared the crap out of me. Um, but I loved it. I loved it. It was exhilarating. It was so much fun. And there was something that would, there's a little bit of joy in that movie. There's something about all these kind of young people hanging out at this camp. There's something so like innocent and silly. There's also a sexiness to it. Um, for my money, there's a little too much of Kevin Bacon's ass, but you know, whatever. Um, it's a nice ass. I, I got to give him that. Uh, but it's, it's America's it's, ass. It is America's ass. It is, it is, it is, it is footloose. Um, Here's the thing. I I fell in love deeper with horror, deeper with movies. It it only solidified everything I had already felt about wanting to be a filmmaker. And then <laughs> cut to a mere 13 years later or 12 years later, um, <coughs> and I'm on set directing uh, uh, a Friday 13th movie. And I have to tell you, um, it wasn't that different. Here's the thing. I was so young and so stupid, but in a good way, that 
no one told me how nervous I should be. No one told me I shouldn't be excited about this job and that I'm not capable of handling it. No one told me that. So I didn't. I, I just went on set and I went, I love this and I'm having fun and this is my version of summer camp and we're going to make this fucking movie and I've got great artists around me and great actors. And look, I, I'm, the, I'm the only Friday 13th that had a six week rehearsal schedule before the movie happened. Like I did that. You know, because I went, yeah, I'm a theater director. I want to I want to work with my actors. Like, that's what I do. And the actors were like, you're going to give us rehearsal? I was like, yeah, let's rehearse. Why shouldn't we? Famously, famously didn't you tell um, John DeLamay that, um, you know, kind of lighten up a little? Like he was playing like a, like he was playing like Hamlet or something. Yes. Yes. He wanted to be Hamlet. I wanted to be Bruce Willis out of Die Hard. And, and did, uh, we, six, we, six degrees, six degrees of separation about Die Hard um, isn't the one that gives uh, Carrie Keegan her uh, her knickers, uh, the girl from the dispatch in Die Hard. It sure is. And by the way, she was the she was the uh, she was our um, scripty. She was our script supervisor. And when I found out that it, Harry, Harry, Harry James, Harry Monster, that's what we called her. That was her nickname. Harry James. Uh, when I found out that she was in Die Hard. I immediately was like, you're reprising your role. She's like, oh, I don't want, I said, you're reprising your role. And so I, not only was she the dispatcher, I got her the same costume. Nice. I actually worked the costumes of Crystal Lake around that costume. Speaking of that, mm -hmm. there's been a uh, laundry uh, debate among the sweaty nerds, the, uh, the um, nudges, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so in the first Friday 13th, yeah, it's it's shot it's shot in New Jersey. The license mm -hmm. plates say New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. The second movie is in Connecticut, but it's supposed to be still Crystal Lake. And the, even the yeah. third one, they show the lottery sign. It's New Jersey, Green Valley, New Jersey. So in yours, right. the color scheme of the uniforms and the signs suggest Connecticut. Where mm -hmm. is Crystal Lake? For for you, <laughs> where is Crystal Lake? Which state? Crystal Lake is still it's still in Jersey. I I threw in Westport on the on the signage. Um, I tried to do certain little, little things that would be just fun Easter eggs for anybody who knows Sean and knows me. I mean, let's put it this way. We never knew that Crystal Lake was in Cunningham County until my movie. That's so true. I mean, it's changed, it's changed name so many times in part six, which I think yours and part six are the best of the series. It's, nice. you know, if camp, nice, camp, 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 camp forest green, I mean, the, right. the name has changed, you know? Right. Right. Look, here's the thing. Um, by the way, Tommy, Tommy McLaughlin and I have become very close friends. I, I, oh, I adore that guy. Um, and part six is my personal favorite of the movies. It, it always has been. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, no, no, no. And, and, and we're really close now. Like we're, it's really kind of amazing. It's a, it's um, a, it's a real, it's a real film. It's not even yes. I mean, just like yours, is, yours is a, yours is a real film. It's not trying Thank to be you. a Friday 13th. It's trying right. to be, it's, you're trying to do Brian De Palma shots. Yes, you know? I am. I am. I am. Brian was one of my first teachers. So yes, yes. Um, and, and I got to tell you, you know, to that end, the, the other thing is that, you know, Sean Cunningham is the reason that, that he's the one who lit in me a fire about Jason goes to hell specifically where he, he said to me early on while I was, you know, prepping the movie, while I was doing storyboards and, and working on the movie, he pulled me aside. He said, Adam, look, here's the thing. Don't compete with other Friday 13th movies. That's a huge mistake. He said, what your competition is, your competition is Terminator 2. Now, they've got a, over $100 million to make that movie. You've got $2.5 million. What are you going to show your audience that James Cameron can't show his? Why should they come and spend the same dollar amount on your movie that they would spend for a movie that costs $100 million? What are you going to get? I think, I, I think that you were making uh, the Friday 13th uh, um of uh, searching for Bobby Fisher, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That is awesome. Yeah. And did you guys that premiere on awesome. the same day too? We did. We premiered on the same day. So, <coughs> so much so. I was so excited about searching for Bobby Fisher that on the night that Jason Goes Tell came out, I bought a ticket for my movie, but I walked into Bobby Fisher. Um, and I watched searching for Bobby Fisher on the opening night of my movie. I There's did. so much... there. Um, <laughs> 
I cannot confirm or deny that I ever, as a dumb teenager, partook in the bootlegging of things. You know, sure. I cannot confirm sure. or deny it. So I cannot confirm or deny that I've ever seen the screenplay for Jason Goes to Hell. Um, so, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, some somewhere in a dream, I dr- I have dreamt uh, of all this material that never made it into the movie. <laughs> and, and I gotta and I gotta tell you that uh, um, that screenplay. One day it would be amazing to see that, you know, um, to sure. see uh, Creighton Duke's uh, um, Sally Mae Crotten, Crotch, Rot- Rotten Crotch. Rot- <laughs> yes, Sa- Sally Mae Rotten Crotch. Yep. It, 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 yep. it would be amazing because you were writing um, a indie darling. You were not mm-hmm. writing a Friday 13th. You were writing real characters yes. in a real situation. Um, and it was. It, it's a beautiful story. It's not about teenagers. It's about... No. You know, twenties. You know. Yep. Ron yep. Dillamay. Well, I figured. I figured that the audience had grown up with the movies as I had done. So it's like, well, why are we not talking to that audience and giving them characters that they can relate to? Um, the, the, you know, the the part, the the thing, the thing for me about about horror sequels and about franchises that drives me a little nuts. They they stop being horror movies. And what do I mean by that? Well, horror movies are intended to scare. They're, it, let's put it this way. I don't want to get, go see a comedy that isn't funny. I have no interest in that. I don't, have, I don't have an interest in comedies that don't make me laugh. So horror movies have to scare us. That's their purpose, is to give us that thrill, to give us that ride. Here's the thing. No one ever, ever, ever has rooted for the shark in Jaws. No one. And that movie is terrifying. It's so scary that there is a whole new generation of kids that went to see that movie in IMAX and in 3D over the summer that will no longer go into the ocean. They just won't go into the ocean. I I still can't. There you go. Okay, so here's the thing. The first Friday the 13th is scary. The second Friday the 13th is scary. Part two is better than part one. I agree. By a lot. And Susan Susan Cunningham edited the film. You know what's funny? I... I, um, I noticed there's uh, um, symmetry in things. You hear that Scorsese has, uh, you know, um, his same editor that he's used a bunch. Tarantino, oh Tarantino famously had Sally before mm-hmm. she passed, and yep. you find out, you know, the, the kind of relationships. Marsha Lucas edited Star Wars. Yep. You know, Paul Hirsch helped, but Marsha uh, Lucas edited. And Marsha Lucas edited Star Wars. Yeah. Susan. I'm sure had a hand heavily in helping edit yeah. part one. Sure. Along, along with Steve and yep. um, B- Bill Frieda and those guys. Yeah. Um, but so what is the relationship between um, Susan and Sean in the early days, as far as how did she, anything good about his films? Did it come from her? Okay. Do you remember in Jason goes to hell? There's the shot where Stephen Freeman first sees the Voorhees house. And the camera cranes underneath him to make the house yeah, boom. Loom. Yeah, it boom. Yeah, booms. Yeah, it does the boom. Okay. So here's the thing. Um, I did that shot. Sean Cunningham walked over, saw it, and went, oh, fucking film school. Okay. Yep. Now, when we were in the first screening of Jason Goes to Hell, the very first test screening, that shot happened. The entire audience went, ooh. And I turned to Sean and I said, God, they must have let a lot of film students in the audience. (laughs) Now, here's the thing. Sean, by his own mouth, this is not me making this this up. This is he said it. He has no style. Quote, unquote, that Sean Cunningham said that. He said it to Peter Brackey. I have no style. I don't understand style. I think it's a waste. I don't get it. I've watched Sean direct. Um, it is like watching an IT manager direct a movie. It's all instructions and no passion, no direction, okay? It's, you walk over here, you look, one, two, beat, you turn, you walk three steps to the right. You d- I'm like, what, what is this? Are you, are, you t- are you choreographing something? What are you doing? There's no talking about, what the actor's intention is. When I brought up motivation for something, Sean said, oh, fuck it, Adam. Tell them their motivation is the check on the other side of the door. That's Sean. 
That was not Susan. Susan was life and interest and great music and understanding story. Now, by the way, Sean understands story. It's not that he doesn't. He does. Um, he just doesn't understand art. It's not who he is. It's not who he is. And I spent a lot of years with Sean because I and I can comment on that. And so you, so you helped pick out the soundtrack or a lot of the soundtrack for Spring Break. I did. I did. I still have all I have all of my 45s with Susan's notes all over the 45s. She came over to my house one afternoon, sat on my on my bedroom floor with me, and we played 45 records. And she and she was like, you know, who do you like? What do you like? You know, she's like, Noel's music, Noel's, Noel's taste in music is terrible, so I need somebody who has better taste. And we went through all these, these, these albums, and then she said, what bands, <coughs> excuse me, what bands do you love? And at the time, I was a giant Cheap Trick fan, like ridiculous. And I said, I really love Cheap Trick. Like, I think they're amazing. And two weeks later, Cheap Trick was recording the song, I Want a Spring Break. I went to a horror convention uh, back in the, um, uh, the mid two thousands. It was it was mm -hmm. the first time I met I met Harry Manfredi, but I've known him for years. Mm -hmm. But it was first time I got to meet him, and mm -hmm. we were we were actually uh, workshopping that script that I sent you for Hearts. He's attached yeah. to be the he's attached to be the composer no matter what. Whenever it gets made, he will score it. That. He said hands oh, down. I yep. love that. And we've been we've been workshopping that script for fifteen years. Um, and so when I got to meet him, um, our friend Petch Lucas, who was a, a webmaster mm -hmm. and sadly mm -hmm. passed, um, yeah. we all got to meet uh, together and we went back to Petch's uh, hotel room and he had made homemade uh, hooch, uh, homemade, uh, you know, um, <laughs> homemade beer, the good stuff. And he made chicken and dumplings, homemade soup. And so Harry Manfredini and me and one other fan are getting drunk and eating homemade chicken and dumpling soup. And Harry gets tipsy and he starts humming and singing some music from his movies. And I offhandedly mentioned to him, you know, it's a shame that the theme song that you wrote for the, the titles for the opening mm -hmm. for Spring Break, The Lauderdale mm -hmm. Ladies. Right. He says, he says, Royce, you know, that was supposed to be on the soundtrack, but then they wanted Cheap Trick. Yeah. So they, they they so they didn't include that song on the soundtrack because of the cheap trick uh, song. That apparently there mm -hmm. wasn't enough room on the on the album to put both those songs. So <laughs> Harry, Harry, but Harry's sitting there and he's like he's singing the surfer Lauderdale lady song, a little tipsy. And it's I should have had a camera out because it's one of those things. I'm in the room with a composer and he's singing his songs. How great is that? Yeah. Dude, and and by the way, you couldn't meet a nicer man. Like he and you couldn't have a better guy to be attached to something. He's just he's such a doll. Um when we were shooting um when we shot his interview for for uh, Hearts of Darkness. Um I said to uh I said to the to the crew, I said, "Look, let's put him um, at the piano. There was a piano in, in the location, which was m one of my closest friends, Michelle Lallaire, who's part of Skeleton Crew and one of the stars of, of Secret Santa. Um, I, uh, I was at her house shooting because she has a beautiful home, and I said, let's put Harry at the piano. And the guy was, who was running the, 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 the day was like, no, nah, I mean, I, I, why would we put it? That's too on the nose, put him at a, at, at a piano. I said, listen, put him at the piano. Trust me on this, because Harry will come alive if you give him a piano so we sat him at the piano and harry looks at him and goes oh geez I, I mean it's nice you put me in a piano but i mean i don't know how to play this thing i mean you know i i uh i work on other, with other instruments <laughs> it's not really and suddenly starts to play brilliantly right just starts playing and he's like oh shoot i guess i do know how to play the piano and on camera during the sh during the shoot he gives a music theory lesson and that's Harry. Like he's he is the consummate composer. He is a guy whose love of sound and music and the understanding of it and the understanding of the emotions that come from it. Nice. Just amazing. Amazing. Right. So he gives this incredible lesson in music. Um, and and it's indicative of who Harry is. Like he just he loves. He loves music. He loves sound. He understands the emotional impact that music has on an audience and, and its importance in each moment of the movie. So he's yeah, a dramatist. No, he is. 
he's a storyteller. He's an actual storyteller with music, um, which is why he's successful and so brilliant at it. So di the different films in the series, um, mm -hmm. they all had a different vibe and a feel. Mm -hmm. And the ones that stood out the most, I, all, I joke around that other than yours, which is the odd number, um, mm -hmm. two, two, four, and six are the best ones. Uh -huh. um, so the, uh, the even numbers seem to be the ones that were the best ones as far as that goes. But yours is outside of that continuity a little. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a separate thing. But mm -hmm. talk about how you made the conscious choice to make a Friday the 13th De Palma movie. <laughs> uh, the De Palma part of it. And by the way, there's a lot of John Woo in there, too. I'm, I'm very heavily influenced by John. Um, the all of the influences as far as filmmaker are concerned are simply that I am I'm a guy who has such respect and such love of what's come before me. Um, I also don't pretend that things aren't from something else. Like I, I wear my influences on my sleeve because I think that that's how style is crafted and created. I'm sure if you had a long talk with David Fincher, you would suddenly see a lot of the, the influences on him and that a lot of that Fincher style is actually cribbed from some other brilliant artists that came before him. Um, you know, Quentin Tarantino has literally stolen every single thing he's ever done. Um, and Sean Cunningham has pretty much stolen every single thing he's done. Um, he, he, John Carpenter never had an idea that Sean Cunningham didn't think was worth stealing. Um, but I got to tell you, you know, when it comes to the 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 actual meat and potatoes of Jason Goes to Hell, and what I what I'm why I'm proud of that movie is that I, I'm a giant fan of the Friday Thirteenth franchise. Like I love it. I, I truly adore it. But even as a kid, I remember thinking, wait a second. So Jason was this 11-year-old hydrocephalic-headed boy in a lake in 30 years after he's dead, yet somehow, three weeks later, he's a full-grown man in a full set of clothes, um, a hideous mutant face. Um, he has learned how to read because the only way you can find people's addresses back in 1981 is by looking in the white pages. Um, he has gotten a driver's license. I mean, you know, Mike, Michael Myers hold my beer. Um, and he's also gotten this incredible sense of humor because he carries his mom's head to Alice's home. He then hides the head in her refrigerator and then he hides, he hides and he waits. He goes, this is going to be amazing. She's going to go get something from the fridge. She's going to find my mom's head. Oh, my God. This is amazing. And only after his big prank, has, after his Ashton Kutcher punked moment, that's when he stabs her in the head. So anyone who ever talks to me about the timeline of Friday 13th, please, why don't you talk to me about the timeline of Halloween next? Because they're both so sound. Such good timelines. Choose Everybody's your own adventure because everyone else. There's like three or oh. four different continuities in the Halloween series. You know, follow your own adventure and stuff. Yeah, dude, dude, I gotta say something. Even the ones that even the continuities that are in the Halloween series are terrible. They're all they're just broken. They're broken. And you know, the, 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 Mustafa Khad was supposed to be the guy who like who was the keeper of the keys of that franchise. What a great keeper! Oh my goodness. I mean, it, 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 it's it's just it, none of it makes sense. So here's the thing. Well, speaking of you, speaking of keys, um, the scene where where Ward throws the keys to ooh. to Stephen and Stephen sees baby Stephanie for the first time, yeah, single handedly, that is one of the most beautiful moments in a film ever because he sees his baby for the first time and he even says. It's my baby. It's the first time I've been able to touch and see my baby. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a parent. I'm a parent now. I melt at that. It's beautiful. Dude, I love that. By the way, that's my favorite scene in the film. That's the one. That's my favorite. Because it, it's um, a real, that's a real movie. That's a real moment. That's you. not a Friday the 13th moment. Well, by the way, what I was saying earlier about, you know, nobody, nobody cheers for, for the shark in Jaws. Dude, it's because 
the villain is the villain and the characters are the ones you're following. The heroes are the ones you're following. So the first Friday 13th, you're following our final girl to the end. You're following Amy Steele in part two. By part three, they are they are just hot teenager number one through number 12. And you, I, I really not, like it. I really like Adrian as a final girl. Yeah. The only thing that trumps that statement is J uh, Amy Steele. Oh, I like dude. her just a, li a, a little bit more. Yeah. Me too. Amy Steele me too. Is, is the perfect final girl. She is. She is. She's smart. Way, she's smart. She's smart. She <laughs> uses psychology to mm -hmm. actually uh, get vanquish the killer by posing as the yep. mother. It's, yep. she's, she's smart. Yes. She's smart. She's really beautiful, but in that very fresh face girl next door way. I mean, the look, huh, again, Heather Lange Camp in, in, in Nightmare on Elm Street, you're so on her side. You're just on her side. You oh, love by the way, that girl. Didn't you um, stage a reading of the screenplay of, of Nightmare on Elm Street for Wes? No, I didn't stage it. I was actually invited. I I, I read I read the first the first uh, table read of that of that script. Nice. Yeah. 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 No, dude. But that's what I'm saying. Like all of these movies, the first ones, you know, the first Texas Chainsaw, you can't find a scarier movie. The problem, <laughs> the problem is once we get into sequels, there's diminishing returns because the fans start to cheer for the villain. The minute you're cheering, cheering for the villain, we're no longer in horror movie land. We're in comic books. We're not. Do your cheering. thing. Do do your thing, cuz. Oh, dude. <laughs> dude. dude. Talk, yeah, talk about that. Uh, uh, getting yeah. to work on the uh, at least in the script form and the conception, the Hatfields and McCoys, bringing yeah. you and Deborah, bringing the Hatfields and McCoys to Toby Hooper's classic. Talk about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was, uh, it was a crazy, it was crazy actually, because Steven Susco had been hired by, um, by Twisted Pictures and by Lionsgate to write this new Texas Chainsaw reboot. Right. And, uh, and Steven's amazing. I love Steven. Steven's a friend and he's, he's tremendous. Uh, he's a great filmmaker. And the thing is, is that Lionsgate did not want a movie about cannibals. They would not allow cannibalism in it. And the problem is, is that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is about cannibals. So Susco, being a madman that he is, wrote a movie about cannibals. And Lionsgate went, no, 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 you can't do this. Why did they not want it? Because they had had a movie that was considered one of the biggest flops in the studio's history, which was Midnight Meat Train. So they did not want cannibalism in any way showing up in this film. So... They told Steven, take all the cannibalism out. We don't want any cannibalism. Don't do that. Steven's response was to put more cannibalism in. So they let Steven go. <laughs> he was finished with his contract, and he went on his way, and Lionsgate and Twisted Pictures went looking for other writers. Well, the producer of the film was a giant fan of Deborah and my writing. Um, that film that was on the blacklist, uh, Gravity, that became Momentum, was, was what he said his favorite script he had ever read. And so he wanted Deb and I to come up with a story. And we did. We came up with two. The one that he went with, which was, trust me, the far more boring of the two, but, but still a good story. Uh, he had us write that up in a couple of pages. We did. And it looked like, you know, we were going to be the ones who got this job. The problem is he hadn't shared any of this with Lionsgate. Lionsgate wanted to meet with everybody in town. So they sent Deborah and my two pages to everyone in town. And suddenly we are up against 17 other writing teams to get the job for the story we wrote. This is not a joke. This happened. So Deb and I were the second to last to pitch. Um, we are in a long line of 17 writing teams. And by that point, we knew our story so well, I had written a 15-page treatment. Deb and I had written the first 11 pages of the screenplay. We did our full pitch, 30-minute pitch, then handed them the 15-page treatment and the first 11 pages of the script and said, we know you guys are under the gun and need to get this done quickly. Here you go. We thought we would start the script. 
we're just too inspired. Uh, yeah, they hired us. They hired us. And, and uh, shocking that we knew our own story better than anybody else could know it. So uh, we got the job. We started working on the movie. And the producer of the movie was a maniac. I mean, a maniac. Um, who would scream at meetings when Lionsgate got our first draft. They wanted us to change a bunch of stuff that they had approved, but they wanted to change it. And my response, when a studio is paying me to make a movie, I do what the people who are paying me want. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. I love when, I love when artists or artists start talking about, you know, you have to buck, you know, buck the studio. You can't just do what they say. Really? You know what a studio does to a writer who does that? They fire your ass. That's how that works. What you have to do is take their notes and turn it into gold. You have to take their ideas, which sometimes are terrible. That's true. Sometimes it's a bad idea. And you have to somehow take that idea and give it life and give it meaning. And then it's a great idea. So the producer kept starting true fights in the room over the script. Dev and I completed our last draft on the script. We had written four for the producer. We wrote an extra two for the, for, the, for the studio. And the studio said to the producer, uh, we love Adam and Deborah. We can't stand you. So we're going to let you go raise your own money for this movie, and we'll put it out. We'll distribute, but we're not going to make this movie with you because you're impossible. So they threw his ass out. He had to go find financing elsewhere, uh, Lionsgate loves Dev and I. We're, we have an amazing relationship with Lionsgate. We, 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 fantastic. So <coughs> once we'd written that script, um, Toby Hooper called us at home. He read our version. He called us and he actually said to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, this is the only true sequel to the first film that I made. Dude, I looked at Deborah and I said, you know what, hon? Put me in a box. I've, I've accomplished everything I want to accomplish. To hear Toby Hooper say that is, um, I, I still can't believe it happened. Um, I mean, that's, that's amazing to, to have the master of horror, um, Toby Hooper, who made an, uh, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, in addition to being a, a horror film, it's mm -hmm. a piece of folk art. Yes, it is. It's a beautiful yes, it film. It's a beautiful film. Yeah. Yep. Um, so talk about, um, you were mentioning, uh, the, the interview you did for Harry for the doc. So talk about yep. the impetus of the doc and, uh, Ooh. any fun anecdotes about it and the, the director that you, uh, uh landed on to uh, bring yeah. it, to knock it, to bring it home for you. Yeah. Um, uh, the doc was something I didn't want to do. Um, it's been brought up to me many, many times, many times over the years, um, there are a lot of people who tried to get it going and, and, and I, I'm, you know, I'm always happy to talk about the movie. I'm always happy to explore it, but I, I just went, who the, who the hell wants this? I, nobody wants this. There's been too many documentaries about these movies to begin with. There's Crystal Lake Memories, not the movie, but the book, uh, by Peter Brackey, who is, a, who is a brilliant, amazing writer. Um, and quite frankly, I'd been burned by a lot of these things. So I was like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living my career. I'm doing the things I want to do. I'm good. Well, there are two really lovely fans who have become really good friends, um, TJ Bowser and Corey Kaufman, who uh, for my birthday four years ago started the Jason Goes to Hell, the final fan page on Facebook. And they did it just as a lark for my birthday. It was the sweetest thing. And the next thing you know, before I knew it, there are thousands of people who are part of that page. And I was like, what is, what the hell is happening here? Well, what was happening is that there was a community of people who were all letting me know that this movie has, in its own way, become a bit of a cult classic. And, um, and I put it out to them, look, if you guys want this documentary, are you willing to pay for it? Are you willing to pay before I make, make the movie? And it is remarkable. They all said yes. And so I started. I'm one of them. Go. I'm one of them. I I'm, a, I'm, a, oh, I'm, dude, a, I'm a loyal are. supporter. I love I know you this are, project. Brother. I know you are. Um, <laughs> and I got to tell you, we, um, 
We put it out there on Indiegogo. And in record time, we were financed so much so that Indiegogo has kept the page up. It's still up. We're still getting donations. And so we've been working on this film. Of course, COVID happened, which is madness because we had shot over 30 auditions. After, two months after the Indiegogo campaign ended, we had 30, 30 auditions in the can. We were ready to rock. And then, <laughs> and then March happened and um, the world shut down. And so we have been spending the last three years uh, climbing and clawing our way to get this movie done. And one of the best things that could have happened was Peter Brackey introduced me to Michael Felsher. Um, I have to tell you, you know, we had been somewhat directionless up until that point. I, 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 and, and the thing is I can't direct the movie. I I'm the subject of the movie, so I can produce this movie, but I need a captain who can, who can really, really command the ship. I've got incredible producers around me, but I really needed a storyteller's voice. And Michael, who unbeknownst to me had also contributed to the documentary financially, Michael <laughs> came up through Peter Brackey. He, he recommended it. Michael really wanted to do it. And he and I met on Zoom. And Michael told me the movie he wanted to make. And I kid you not, I actually started to cry. Tears rolled down my eyes from, from, from this man's vision of what he wanted to do. And I have to tell you, since Michael has come on board, I have a movie that I am so proud of. Um, not only that, but I got one of my best friends, a childhood friend. We've been friends since we were 14 years old. He was my roommate at one point. He worked at our Greenberg with me. Um, a guy named Eric Beatner, who has been nominated for the Emmy nine times as an editor. Uh, Eric Beatner is cutting this movie. And him, Michael, and I have been working on it tirelessly. And man, it's it's a really good movie. And it's heartfelt, it's touching, and it's about Jason goes. To hell. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. kind of extraordinary, man. It's a cool movie. And it's not like any of the other Friday docs. It's not like any of them. It's again. In the same way that, you know, Jason Goes to Hell, I was trying to make a film. I wasn't trying to make a slasher movie. I was trying to make a film. This is not a fan service documentary. This is a film. This is a documentary feature. Um, and um, I think people are going to be really surprised by it. I think there's a lot of stuff that people don't know. Um, I think there's some questions that are going to get answered. I also think that there's some people who think that it's going to go into some controversy or specific controversies that it's not going to go into, and it's going to go into other controversies. So, um, yeah, man, it's, um, uh, I'm it's curious to movie. ask, I'm, I'm curious to ask Yeah, things that were talked about in interviews years ago when mm -hmm. you started the documentary. Yeah. Based on the new direction of how the documentary is going to go, were there things that everybody was talking about and riffing off of each other because that was the story that was originally going to be told? Are there tr topics and storylines in the documentary that are no longer relevant to what you, what you guys are focused to tell now? No, I mean, it's it, it, there hasn't been that much of a tectonic shift. It's just that the whole concept behind it has altered <laughs> for the better. Um, I will say this. Look. For example, there's a lot of people who want to like hear like, ooh, what's a jerk between Adam Marcus and Kerry Keegan? Well, everybody knows those freaking stories. And quite frankly, it stuff's boring. It's nonsense. Um, and Kerry and I made peace with each other and we're good. And Kerry's moved on in her life. Kerry's one of the only people in the cast that's not interviewed in the movie. Um, and quite frankly, had she been interviewed, maybe we would talk about, about what went down between her and I. But she's not there, so I'm not, I'm not giving it any weight. It's not, it's not fair to her, and it's just not, it's not interesting. Um, I do get into it about Sean Cunningham um, a lot. I am honest about it. Um, it's not a hit piece by any means. It is not. But uh, I talk about how hard this was because it was hard, man. Um, Sean is a bully. Sean's a bully, flat out. Um, you should contact you should you should contact some of the people that have uh, filmed him at those conventions saying his shit, and actually ask him if you can use 
the footage they shot here's to be thing. able to get him into it. Here, here's the thing. Um, maybe I am the reason that some of those people shot those things. Nice. Wink, wink. Wink, wink. Got so it. I understand. I, Sean, I understand what you're saying. I do. Sean, Sean has dug his own grave, quite frankly, and I am very happy to fill it in for him. <laughs> um, I, I am uh, wondering the you you were talking about um, you know uh, being a filmmaker growing up in a film environment. You mentioned uh, before um, in some interview that your uncle Ned was in the burning. Mm -hmm. Ned is one, yeah. My uncle Ned, he was one of the leads of the burning. He played Eddie in the burning. Um, Ned is uh, Ned's a remark was a remarkable actor. We we lost Ned in in March. Um, he uh, he he died of cancer. Um, I was just in New York for his memorial. Um, and uh, Ned Ned is that guy. Ned is a guy that if you saw him, you'd be like, oh my god, Ned Eisenberg. I've been watching that guy for the last forty years. He's uh, uh, beyond gifted. And I will tell you, we, we did his memorial at a theater in New York, um, right across from BAM, the theater for a new audience. Uh, there was not an empty seat in three full balconies. It's a huge theater. The entire place was packed with the most remarkable acting talent you could ever count on. It was, it was unbelievable, dude. Um, literally I was sandwiched between Julie Taymor, the director of the Lion King um and christopher maloney and fisher stevens and it, it just went on and on and on and on it was it was incredible so ned uh yeah ned was in the burning <laughs> ned is also in the exterminator the warriors the wanderers he's the lead uh with bruce willis of last man standing um he, he's he's brilliant and literally he's in every sixth episode of law and order the entire run of all the shows um he's amazing so that's Nettie. And then my uncle Joe Ellison wrote, directed, and produced Don't Go in the House. So, which was in a lot of double bills with Friday the 13th, the year the Friday the 13th came out. Um, so, yeah. Don't go, they, was, they, was Don't Go in the House also um, a, um, a uh, Steve Manasian, uh, Phil Scuderi, and, uh, and um, you know, the Boston guys? Did they also, the no. Hallmark releasing Esquire films? No, it wasn't through Phil So Scary. Um, it, it was, uh, I don't remember who the finance company was, but it wasn't Phil. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure it was some shady, shady shit. Like all those movies were shady. Like all of them, you know, had money I have this, I have this the back of a truck, you know. Yeah, she, yeah. And they all yeah, have cigars exactly. and they're all, yeah. Um, so my dad was a filmmaker. I'm from mm -hmm. New York and that's why I got into film. And my dad, by the way, uh, he was in the movie. The song remains the same. He actually was sure. on tour with, with Led Zeppelin. He, he was a camera guy and helped behind the scenes on that. He was an apprentice for a magician and illusionist named the amazing Randy, James Randy. He mm -hmm. helped, he worked uh, side by side with him. He met Alice Cooper and Debbie Harry, um, working in New York. You, you know, you, um, you, you meet all these people and he sure. got me to want to work on films too. And one of the things that to speak to the documentary you're doing is I'm doing a documentary right now. Um, oh, that's awesome. I, I didn't know that. What you, what's your doc? I, I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. And it, it occurred to me that the silent film era, Norman studios and all that stuff was the hub of East coast filmmaking. And the religious right decided they wanted to send all those little scallywags, uh, all the all the the naughty filmmakers that are causing <laughs> ruckus. They sent them packing. They just sent them packing out west. And wow. for years, wow. when I when I first moved here in early two thousands, though I heard about the rumblings of film stuff happening, and then over the last decade plus. There's been uh, film groups formed. We have the 48 hour film festival that came mm -hmm. here um, mm -hmm. in 09, 07, 09, something like that. And mm -hmm. we have every week, we have uh, Film Bar Mondays, which is a little group that we do where we get together and we schmooze and we talk about That's projects awesome. and stuff. And I decided I want to tell a documentary, long form, 
-hmm. where it's a love letter to the history of Jacksonville, its film community, and the journey from the silent era to where we are today. Um, yesterday was the first day of production. I Bravo, interviewed five. Brother, that's fantastic. I, I, inter I interviewed five people. I have three more d days already lined up and then more following. I'm interviewing podcasters, casting directors, agents. I'm interviewing the city producer of Jacksonville in the city hall to actually talk to the guy who runs the city for film. Um, I'm, I'm talking to all these people. The moment that I told people, it's one thing to say, hey, do you want to come work on my passion project for a weekend and not get paid? Sure. Some people are like, ah, people are like, I'm busy. You know, some people say they'll do it. But the moment you say, I'm making a documentary about you oh, and sure. what you do and what you do. Yep. Yep. And it only requires, all it requires is them to show up and the crew to be there to shoot them. It's easy to get one person scheduled to line up instead of an ensemble. You and the, the, the response that I've got from people when I said I wanted to do this is suddenly like some people were like, yes. And then they dot, dot, dot say, this is amazing. Way to step up. You're telling a beautiful story that needs to be told. And, awesome. and, and I feel like it's one of the most meaningful things I will do in my career up to this point and moving forward is chronicling this great city and maybe making an awareness. We're going to put it in a film festival the year after next, because we're going to have the entire, uh, all of this year coming up to work on and craft it because the, the late submissions are in November. So there'll be no time to mm -hmm. do it, mm -hmm. but it gives me time to craft it and create a, 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 an opus of our town. And the reason I bring it up is, what is a piece of advice you could give to people like myself and also to other people who are trying to do a documentary about a topic? Okay. Here's what I can tell you. The most important thing is you, you, you start with your game plan of like, here's the story structure I want to tell as a movie, the same way you would a feature. But, but um, much like the filmmaker, you know, uh, David Guggenheim who made uh, capturing the Freemans and then the jinx. Be open to the surprise that interviews will take you so that if this story morphs and, and shifts and changes its sands under your feet, just go with it. Allow it to happen because you can end up with a story 10 times more compelling than the one that you're already compelled by and you never saw it coming. And if you're too focused on your story, on the simplicity of your story, and you're not there to, to follow the route, you're not being a good enough detective. And a documentarian is a detective. They find the story. They don't create the story, they find it. And I, I, I personally feel the more, like I'm working on a documentary series right now with the company. And in that series, the director of the film had a really specific way he was going, right? But he kept butting up against this one very interesting nugget that was like, wait a second, there's a mystery there. Why are you not going after the mystery? So we went, listen, if we're going to do this, you got to follow the mystery. So follow it. He did. The whole documentary changed. And suddenly it became a movie, not just about the subject, but about the director, about the, about the investigator opening up a can of worms and then following the worms where they went. And suddenly we've got a movie that's so fucking interesting. And we're talking to people that we never thought we'd be talking to. And suddenly it's opened up and opened up and opened up. So another, another well, another question is I'm a person who also is on a, in the sphere of um, peers with a lot of the mm -hmm. people that are being interviewed. And sure. so you are in the documentary that's about your film. Where's the line? Where's the line drawn of including yourself in a documentary about a bigger picture? If you know that you are part of that story, how do you not put yourself in it too much? If you have, if you have a lot to say, here's the thing. I was interviewed <laughs> for uh, about nine hours. Oh, wow. Okay. 
So did you wear a diaper? <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. There is a nine hour interview with me about Jason Gosell. We did it over two days. Um and and after my editor and my director looked at the nine hours of footage, the director came back and said, Okay, you are the skeleton of this movie. Like you're the backbone. And I'm gonna hang all of the organs and all the other bones off of that backbone. So it gave the movie a shape where had I not been there, we don't know what the shape would have been. But that, because, uh, because of the kind of storyteller I am and because of my knowledge base of all of this, it was able to give him the vertebra that he needed in order to make the rest of the body work. Um, but that's a movie that I wrote and directed and that I was the one who was pro- not only producing the doc, but also... The fans wanted me to tell this story. Great. Happy to do so. There are another 45 people interviewed for this film. And they're all going to be in there. They're all represented. So, um, again, you go where the story is. And the thing is, the story is about a 23-year-old knucklehead who got the keys to the most important, biggest horror franchise in the world. That's the story. And who the fuck would let a 23-year-old do that? Well, you um, you were either most the most powerful... Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the man is a eunuch, apparently. You, you yes. forced his hand. Take the fucking hockey mask out of the movie. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. I overpowered Sean Cunningham. Yes. Said no one ever. <laughs> so... Um, T- t- what do you have working on now? I mean, uh, Secret Santa is yeah. bar none. It's it's in the um, the the. If it isn't already, it should be talked about. I mean, hmm. for the people Thank that you. haven't seen, I was holding it up before on Blu-ray. Now get your copies. Yep. Um, it's yep. got it's well. It's got an amazing documentary on that Blu-ray, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Um, it is in contending. Well, it's a better movie than um. Silent Night, Lady Night, and stuff like that, and you know, it, it's better made than all that stuff. Better made than well, I would say that it's my it it's tied with Black mm-hmm. Christmas. So you're tied with Bob Clark. Wow, thank you very much. You I know. T- that is a giant honor. I appreciate that. Thank you. I watched. Uh, we had a tradition. My wife and my uh, since we we've been married six years. You know, congratulations. Known, known awesome. each other. Thank thank you. We uh, we got married on Friday the thirteenth, two thousand sixteen. Well done. Um, well done, we, sir. We 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 got uh, married lakeside. Um, we put up we put up um, you know uh, the we got a replica made of the welcome to Camp Crystal Lake sign from part one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We got uh, we got a person who makes replica masks to make us a really not a flimsy fucking mask, but the 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 one from parts um, four or six. It's it's heavy duty. It's got the axe mark in it. Um, Adrian King sent us some of her Crystal Lake wine. Oh. And we had that at the thing and the m- flanging melody that Alice is in the canoe for. Is the, <laughs> the muse that's the music my wife walked down to the aisle to. That's genius. It is it, it is serene it's and amazing. beautiful. It's amazing. You know, but um so what else do you have by the you're way, working by on? By the way, the other things that I'm that I'm doing right now, um, <laughs> it's so exciting. Uh, so we have the documentary series that I mentioned earlier. We have the doc that we've talked about a little bit. But um, I am um, I am directing uh, a movie called Domestic Terrorist next year. Uh, that is a very very dangerous little thriller that I am very proud of. Um, that movie will be happening next year. We are also, uh, Deborah and I wrote, and myself, Deborah, and our genius producing partner, Brian Sexton, we're making a movie uh, called Hunting Season that will be Bob Kurtzman's return to the director's chair. Nice. Uh, we're, shooting, we're shooting that in Kentucky next year. We are also doing a movie that we've been working on for about four years now called Fat Camp Massacre. Nice, that, yes. That... That will do for people of size what Get Out did for people of color. The real um, Hunger Games. 
That's the one, the real Hunger Games. Well done. <laughs> um, we are uh, we are also we have three other micro budget projects that we're doing. One that I am incredibly excited about. Uh, that I will be directing one of those as well. The one that I'm really excited about. Um, so yeah, we we've got uh, we've got over half a dozen things going right now that we are just again. Hmm, I, I I love I love Skeleton Crew. I love. I've always loved the concept of it. It was the name of my, my film company when I was 15 years old. Um, that guy, Eric Beatner, the editor was one of the original yeah. founding members of the, of the troupe. Um, and I love my actors and I love working this way. I love making movies that I really believe in. Um, it's a lot harder to get people seeing them. You know, secret Santa's won awards all over the world at this point. Um, we've got amazing reviews. Everybody who sees the movie really, really gets charmed by it. But I got to tell you, man, it is, it's a slog. Like, and you know this, you know this better than anybody, man. It, you know, getting people to put eyeballs on things when it's not Jason or Freddy or Leatherface, um, it's, uh, it's a tall order. It's, it's not easy. Uh, but I've, made, I've, made, I've made two feature yeah. movies, um, gratis, you know, so people yeah. were doing it on, on Sweat Equity. Yep. I've done two, two feature movies. The second feature film had an ending that literally um, somebody told me, a uh, studio uh, periphery said, don't send it to any studio because they might buy your movie, then they own your ending, they're going to remove the ending, and you can never use the ending on anything ever again. Right. So he said, make your movie yourself, otherwise someone could, uh, you know, yeah. take, take your film and, and, and take your baby and, and do something horrible to your baby. Horrible to um, and And so... You know, I it it inspired me to just say, well, I'm put my money where my mouth is, and I kept mm -hmm. everybody well fed, well fed, and just like you said about with, um, you know, making sure Agent Marcus didn't bleed her feet out. You know, that's right. There were some people on the film that I had special rapport with that I pulled aside. You know, they say always praise and praise in public, and do the other stuff where no one can hear because you it's bet. always about. Yeah. And people would go to bat. There were things that I got people to do that it was controlled violence. Two mm -hmm. people, three people worked out a chore choreography and it was a, a, like you run an acting school so you can speak to this. Yeah. There is a trust exercise where one actor said, I my goal in the scene is mm -hmm. to do X, Y and Z that is horrible and violent. Your goal in the scene is to make sure I don't succeed. And right. when we say when, when the director says action, we're both going to be bulls in a china shop and try to achieve our goal, which means to stop the other one from achieving their goal. Sure. On if I didn't have two actors that trust each other, literally they were one moment away from it being real, but they kept it just an arm's distance mm -hmm. and look real because it almost was. Mm -hmm. but they knew where that line was and they knew a safe word to make sure that they didn't cross that sure. line. But, but only trust, only if you have trust, can you actually get that? I agree. And, By the way, and being, look, an, being an acting coach, talk, uh, an acting teacher, talk about that, that importance of the trust and stuff. Oh, it's a it, dude. It's everything. I mean, it's everything. You, you, uh, trust between director and actor is, is uh, there's nothing more important on a set. But when it comes between the actors, look, you know, in, in, in the way I teach, we do a thing called Fight Club before class. So for an hour before class, we're doing stunt training. We're doing, um, uh, you know, combat theory and all of that. And uh, my coordinator, Freddie James, who's also one of the leads of Secret Santa, um, you know, on Secret Santa, I had over 200 stunts in that movie. And they were all performed by the cast, all of them. There's one stunt that I brought in another stunt woman for who's part of the troupe. And she's a great actress. Um, but every other stunt was done live on set from those actors. So you can see their faces in every one of these. By the way, I had people in their 70s performing stunts. Your and brother it. makes it your, your brother's head makes a cameo in the film. It sure does. It sure does. <laughs> um, and dude, I gotta tell you, like that's that's one of those things that, you know, if you don't have that trust, you don't have a safe environment that's not a place I would ever want to make a movie. So there was not a bruise out of 200 stunts, not a bruise. Nice. Yeah. I want everybody to 
if they get a chance, check out. I mean, we have he's he's done this cult classic, and he's also done this, which will become a cult classic in time, I believe. Um, check out this man's body of work. He's done so much stuff, um, and he's gonna he's gonna be doing so much more. And we have you know just like with the, the documentary I'm doing. If you ever need East Coast stuff in Florida, we have a we we have a amazing infrastructure to people. If you ever have any of these stories that uh, you're telling or people that are telling for you or with you, bring some work to Jacksonville because we sure would love to have you. I love it. I love it, brother. That'd be awesome. But it has been a pleasure talking with you. I have known this man for uh, uh, decades. Yeah, um, I met him. I met him when I was in college doing running this little fan little website. This was before Crystal Lake Memories, so there mm -hmm. wasn't all these DVDs, all these books. A lot of the people that were in the series, when I contacted Sean, he was, "Why do you want to talk to me about that stuff?" Yep. Um, yep. Harry was Harry was gracious enough, and we've been friends for decades. Victor Miller has been buddies with me also. Uh, He's since. lovely. Victor Victor is lovely, lovely man, and, and, and so. When you were doing your theater troupe stuff in the 90s, mm -hmm. um, you were a teenager w ambitiously doing, you know, just the grind. You were just doing it. I yep. was doing this fan website stuff before it was chic to do it. Sure. You know, sure. and I think that following passion and, and doing what is not the popular road, the, the road less traveled. You yep. know, it seems to have it seems to have the reward at the end of that uh, that road less traveled more more really so does. than the the goldenly paved road is the uh, what is that? There's some proverb about uh, the road to hell is paved through excess or something. Mm -hmm. But um, what are your final um, observations of a career lived and a future mm -hmm. yet to be de yet to be determined? Uh, look, I I you know I started my second chapter a few years ago, and I'm happier than I've ever been. I'm making things that I believe in. Um, I am very blessed. I've had a, I've had an amazing career thus far. I love what I've worked on. I love the people I've worked with. You know, I am very much a Hollywood screenwriter in many ways, in that I've got scripts literally on every shelf in town. I, I've I've been bought by every studio, uh, television as well, um, and so I've made a, a lovely living being an artist and I have never had to work one day outside of my chosen profession that I know how, how lucky I am. I, I know it, but I have to tell you, none of it means anything without a remarkable family. And that includes my family of friends, my family of actors, the people that I brought close to me and that I keep close to me. Um, my, my skeleton crew is my family, my, my chosen family. And that, that makes all of it mean something. Um, what I would say to anybody out there who wants a career, be willing to do anything you need to do to get it. Be willing to work tirelessly. But most importantly, live your life. Enjoy your life. Um, we get one go around at this. And you need to make it special by being wonderful to the people around you. Damn and Skippy. I, I hope at the end of my days, that's how people see what I've done. Well, and just yes, like damn I, Skippy. Damn Skippy. <laughs> uh, so I, I popped that balloon. You were, you were inflating it. I'm sorry for that. Uh, no, 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 not uh, at all. Not at all. Yeah. I, I told, I told Harry that you called, um, what was your nickname for Harry? Uh, uh, Uncle, Uncle Heshy. Uncle, Uncle Heshy. Heshy. I have always thought of him you know, in the later part of my life, uh, as uncle Harry and, you know, you've had a, you've had a brother since you've been friends with me. So, um, you know, mm. you, you got a brother for life. You got a brother for life, man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And I know that, and I am a fan of yours as well. So know that going in. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Adam Marcus, and we've had the pleasure of speaking with him this evening. Please, uh, check him out on social media and, uh, check out his body of work. Uh, he may have started off uh, getting fans interested in what Jason goes to hell, but that was just the beginning, and he's had so much since then. So, give give everybody uh, everybody give it a, give him a chance. Uh, check out his other work, and um, keep an eye out for new great things coming from the man, um, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Marcus. And this has been TTFT. Thanks. Good night.
Thank you. Good night, brother. Thank you.